is going to be who are our role models? Who are people that you see or know, uh, maybe have read about um, and want to emulate? So try to think about some of the most outstanding people that you know. For example, uh, let's give a few models. You may know someone who is kind and uh, ever so giving, a really selfless person. Um, you probably know someone like this or know of um, people who are like almost not of this world, pure hearted, devout, sincere, maybe pious. Let's just say saintly people, pious, self-sacrificing, saintly people. Okay, we hold these people in very high regard. They're rare. So should that be your role model? Is that what you're shooting for for yourself. And the question isn't whether this is a wonderful way to live. This is an amazing way to live. But is that actually the role model for you in the upcoming year? And given that it's Elul and we're thinking about these questions of what we want to be like in the upcoming year. Okay, so do you want to be more like that person, selfless, saintly? Okay, and also we're not asking whether you can actually get there in a year, but is that your goal? Okay, is that you're shooting? For? Is that what you're shooting for? So maybe or maybe not. Okay, let's take a different model. Um, there are people who you know um, who are doing great things, amazing things, accomplishing, doing, 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 making a giant impact on this world. Um, and that kind of person may or may not be a saint. I would say often that person is not a saint. Um, in many cases, that person will be a little extreme, maybe a perfectionist, maybe a workaholic. Um, so has faults. Um, often that person is not exactly balanced, let's say. Um, and that is often the case among outliers, right? People who go big. Um, but you might say, if you're honest about it, how do you achieve anything big without being a little extreme, okay? Without being a little bit out there. So maybe that is a different model that you might take on for the year, sort of to break out of your comfort zone and think bigger and go bigger. Okay, that's, that would be another different model. Okay, another example, a different, a different model. Perhaps you know someone who stands out because of their amazing balance that they have in their life. Um, they seem to have it together. They seem to have it all. They balance work and family, success without letting it get to their head. There's someone that you can count on, someone that maybe the community counts on. And this person may or may not be especially saintly, right? Selfless, they may or may not be, but certainly what they are is solid, impressively solid. Um, wouldn't it be something to actually achieve that kind of balance in your life? balance mentally, balance spiritually, balance emotionally. Okay, so this is also rare to find, hard to achieve, um, and impressive when you see someone that actually does achieve this, it does exist. Um, okay, is that what you're shooting for? That would be a different thing. So this is all to say, just uh, uh, giving those few examples, that there isn't necessarily one single model of success in this world. Those are three different examples, that each of which was impressive in its own way, right? So like the selfless saint or the extraordinary achiever or the person who manages to actually find balance in their life. They're all exceptional, impressive, all different. And Halavai, we should be any of these. But again, the question um, we'll think about a little bit is what is your goal? What do you want to be in the next year? Because Elul is the month of introspection. Um, so, you know, obviously there's a month of tshuva, and we say, of course, um, tshuva, but um, often what that means, which is, which is fine, actually it's great, is we start small, we focus on little things, we pick up an extra mitzvah, um, we try to speak a little less Lashon Hara, we, we do a little more good and a little less bad, let's say, but, the, but we're going to think a, tonight a little bit about the bigger picture also, which is tshuva towards what? What are you actually trying to become in the year ahead? And, and how... Should we even start thinking about these difficult questions? What does our tradition have to say? Okay, so with that background, let's shift gears a little bit. Um, we'll get back to that in a bit. So the, the Torah in Parshat Naso um, tells us about a person who chooses an unconventional and extreme life of dedication to Hashem, and that is the Nazir, okay? The Nazir, the Nazarite, the person who vows never to drink a drop of wine and lets their hair grow wild and separates themselves from all uh, tumah, all impurity, even in the case of the death of a close relative. So basically, you know, Nazir is, is kind of separated, um, couldn't even go to their own parents' funeral. It's an extreme 
form of piety, you might say. So our rabbis wonder, is this sort of abstinence or asceticism or you know, withdrawing from the, from the normal physical ways of the world? Okay, is this a model that we should aspire to or not? The Torah tells us that this institution exists. The Torah tells you that you can be an Azir if you want to be, but should you? Does the Torah want you to be uh, an Azir? Okay, so if you start just, just reading those psukim, um, the text of the Torah itself is somewhat ambiguous on this point. On the one hand, the Torah tells us that um, the Nazir is described as Nezer Elohav al Rosho, the crown of God is upon his head. So that sounds pretty good. And then the next Pasuk describes the Nazir as Kodesh Hu La Hashem, he's holy to God. Okay, so so far so good. But at the end of his period of Nazirut, um, what stands out is that we're told that the Nazir has to bring a chatat, a sin offering. So the question is, the classic question of why is that? What is his sin? Every Nazir has to end his period of Nazirut with a sin offering. What is that about? Okay, that's the classic question. If he's so holy to God and has the crown of, of God upon his head, why the chatat? Why the sin offering? Okay. So what's clear is that the Nazir is unusual. He's an outlier, but uh, um, or he, he or she actually uh, is an outlier, but is the Nazir unusually good or unusually bad? Okay, so from the, from the Torah itself, let's say it's not entirely clear. And, if, and then when you kind of move forward um, in our tradition, the rabbis uh, in the Gemara debated this question, uh, whether the Nazir is considered primarily holy, let's say, or primarily a sinner. And, uh, and, and, and the broader question of whether other extreme forms of saintly asceticism are to be praised or not. Okay, so this comes up in Masecha Tanit, Anyud Aleph Amud Aleph. The Gemara quotes a statement of Shmuel who says, Kol Hayashem Betanit Nikra It's a broader statement, not talking about the, the Nazir yet, just saying anybody, Shmuel's statement is that anyone who observes voluntary fasts is called a sinner. Uh, so, right, someone who takes on these extra voluntary fasts. And then that's the opening through which the Gemara then quotes the opinion of Rabbi Elazar HaKapar that a Nazir is fundamentally viewed as a sinner, according to uh, Rabbi Elazar HaKapar. So the Gemara says that Shmuel, the Gemara reasons that Shmuel must agree with the following reason, reasoning. If a Nazir who only restricts himself from drinking wine is called a sinner, right, because he has to bring this chatat, the sin offering, then how much more so uh, a person who takes on a whole series of voluntary fasts, of course, must be a sinner. That's what the Gemara assumes must be uh, the reasoning of behind Shmuel's statement, to which the Gemara responds, but there's another opinion, exactly the opposite, um, which says uh, that an Azir is described in the Torah as holy, as kadosh, that his abstinence is praised. And so the Nazir is not a good support for Shmuel's opinion that extra fasting or other forms of asceticism would be viewed by the Torah as sinful, okay? So that's the discussion of the Gemara. What's the bottom line? How are we to view a Nazir? Is he extra holy? Is he a sinner? The Gemara leaves that debate unresolved, okay? It's an ongoing machloket. And as we get into then the period of the Rishonim, we find perhaps uh, in that period, perhaps the most enthusiastic, most enthusiastic pro-Nazir voice of all in Ramban. Right, Ramban, uh, for him, there was no doubt that the Torah was presenting the Nazir as a Roma. Becoming a Nazir may be difficult, it may be beyond most folks, but um, becoming a Nazir is something to be praised and something to aspire to, at least according to the Ramban. So here's the line, I'll, I'll, I'll read it from uh, the Ramban uh, commenting um, on, uh, on a pasuk in, uh, in the sixth chapter of Bamidbar. Okay, I'll just read it in English. It says, the reason for this sin offering brought by the Nazir at the conclusion of his vows is not stated in the text. The rational explanation appears to be, this is Ramban saying, the rational explanation appears to be that this man is actually committing a transgression by concluding his vows. For up till now, he's been separated in his holiness and in his service to God. It would have been more fitting for this man to remain a Nazir forever sanctified unto his God. He therefore, Ramban goes on to say, requires atonement for deciding to return to the defilement associated with the desires of this world. Okay, that's the quote from the Ramban. So what Ramban is saying is that the Nazir 
reaches a level of holy service to Hashem that most of us do not, and it would be fitting for that person to remain a Nazir forever. That would be amazing. The Nazir's only sin, according to the Ramban, is not maintaining that level of, let's just call it ascetic piety, right, separation um, from the uh, from the defilement, the tum'ah, associated with the desires of this world, quote unquote, right? The only sin of the Nazir is ending that state, okay? But this is, of course, a matter of dispute, as it was in the Gemara. So taken on the other side, typically, uh, we say Ramban on one side, uh, Rambam, um, the other kind of, you know, another great titan of, uh, let's just say, medieval Spanish Jewry, okay, took a different approach. Um, and just, I have to say it, just since anytime you have Rambam versus Ramban, uh, just so we're on the same page, uh, you know, it's always a little bit confusing. You know, Rambam, uh, of course, Rabbi Moshe ben Maimon, uh, Ramban, Rabbi Moshe ben Nachman, they lived, their lives over, overlapped, of course, um, but the Ramban would have been uh, only 10 years old when Rambam died, okay, in, in the year 1204. Anyways, um, so you have these two great titans who took different uh, sides of this debate, let's say. Um, they had different views on the Nazir, and it would be tempting to map their views onto the earlier debate from the Gemara. As if one of them thinks that the Nazir is holy and amazing, and the other one thinks that the Nazir is a sinner and terrible, okay? As if it's all black and white, right? Kind of holy or sinner, Rambam versus Ramban. Um, and, and you will sometimes hear people present it that way, um, as, if that, as if they kind of map onto the two views from the Gemara, but, but that would be a vast oversimplification. Um, that really sells Rambam's position uh, short, let's say. It turns out that Rambam's view on the topic is much more subtle and nuanced. And so it's Rambam's view on this topic that we're going to focus on for the rest of this year tonight. Um, and I think we'll find that exploring Rambam's view on this topic um, of the Nazir and of asceticism and piety and saintliness, that whole kind of range of topics, Rambam's view will help us think more broadly about the question that we started with, which is kind of who are, who are our role models? Who are our spiritual mo role models? Um, what do we want to achieve for ourselves in the coming year? Okay, so let's dive in. That was all kind of the big background. Okay, let's dive in. So Rambam's position with regard to the Nazir appears at first to be very confusing, quite puzzling. Okay, so how so? Because in some places, Rambam seems to take a positive view of the Nazir, while in other places, he seems to be negative on the Nazir. So it's a bit confusing, and you have to kind of work your way through it. So on the negative side, Rambam writes in, of course, his great work, the Mishnah Torah, in Hilchot Deot, in the third chapter, the very beginning of the third chapter, so that is the laws of human character traits, okay, Hilchot Deot. Um, he says there that people, uh, there are people, he says there are people who will be tempted to live a life of monastic asceticism, like the life of, of a monk, okay, extremely pious, separate from the world. We see this tendency in many times and places across cultures, okay, the idea of a monk, a um, person who lives that kind of separate, pious, ascetic life, okay. These people who are tempted to live this way say to themselves, and I'm now quoting from the Rama, these people say to themselves, I shall separate from certain desires to a very great degree and move away from them to the opposite extreme. For example, he will not eat meat, nor drink wine, nor live in a pleasant home, nor wear fine clothing, but rather wear sackcloth and coarse wool and the like, just as the pagan priests do. This, and the quote continues. So this too is a bad path, as it is forbidden to walk upon it. Whoever follows this path is called a sinner, as it says regarding the Nazir. And the Kohen shall make an atonement for him for his having sinned regarding his soul. Okay, that's that line um, at the end of, uh, uh, of the discussion in Parsha Naso. Okay, so then, this is Rambam continuing. Our sages declared, if the Nazir who abstained only from wine re requires atonement, how much more so does one who abstains from everything? Therefore, our sages directed man to abstain only from those things which the Torah denies him and not to forbid himself permitted things by vows and oaths, of and oaths. okay? As our, as our sages stated, 
Are not those things which the Torah has prohibited sufficient for you that you must forbid additional things to yourself? Okay, end quote. Okay, long quote. But sounds pretty clear from this. Um, you would think Nazir, bad, right? Nazir, sinner. Uh, asceticism, not good. The message seems to be don't deny. This is kind of the final word in that, in that you know, section. Do not deny yourself all the wonderful things that Hashem has created in this world. Don't create additional restrictions on yourself. Don't be a monk. Okay, but not so fast. Because elsewhere in the Mishnah Torah, Rambam is more complimentary of the Nazir. Rambam writes at the end of Hilchot Nazirut, when he's actually talking about the Nazir specifically, he says as follows. This is in the 10th chapter. Um, I'm going to also read the quote here. He says, if, however, a person takes a vow to be a Nazir in a holy manner, so if he takes this vow in a holy manner, this is delightful and praiseworthy. And concerning this, the Torah says, the crown of God is upon his head. He's holy to God. And scripture equates him with a prophet, as it says in the book of Amos, and from your sons I will raise some prophets, and from your youths some Nazarites, okay, some Nazirim. And similarly, in Mor Nebuchim, in the Guide to the Perplexed, in the, in the third book, um, Rambam praises the Nazir. He says, simply, he when he's describing all the mitzvot and kind of their rationales, he says, for he who abstains, Again, a quote, he who abstains from drinking is called holy. His sanctity is made equal to that of the high priest. In not being allowed to defile himself even to his father, to his mother, and the like, the honor is given him because he abstains from wine. Okay, so what is Rambam's view? Is the Nazir a good guy or is he a bad guy? Is he a role model that we should look up to or not? And more generally, what's Rambam's view of asceticism? and a life of abstinence and selflessness, of a life of extreme piety and self-abnegation, you could say, of which the Nazir is perhaps one extreme example. We saw that Ramban was fully on board with this kind of lifestyle, seems, with a life of separation from the physical world. Okay. Um, but Rambam's view, we will see, is different. Rambam seems to have a much more ambivalent view about the life of the Nazir, in one place, we saw he called him a sinner for, abs for abstaining from things that would otherwise be permitted to him, for all the good things that God created in this world that are available to him. In another place, he praises the Nazir as holy, like a high priest, like a prophet. Okay, so that's the, that's the puzzle. Uh, what's going on? And to understand Rambam's view of the Nazir, we have to take a step back. We first need to think a little bit about Rambam's view more broadly about what constitutes a healthy spiritual life in the first place. Because the Nazir is a very extreme example, but let's just, let's look at Rambam's view, which he lays out um, of what constitutes a spiritually healthy life in general. Okay, and again, we're kind of getting back to this question of who, who should our role models be? What are we aiming for? Okay, so there are two places uh, in, in Rambam's writings where he dives into this topic at length. So we have to kind of do the, 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 the background. So the first place that Rambam deals with these issues, this whole set of issues, is in his commentary to the Mishnah, in uh, which was, you know, the commentary of the Mishnah was Rambam's first great work, right? He, he wrote that, at, uh, I think it was the age of about uh, 30, I believe. Um, and this was a major achievement, right? His first great work. Um, and in addition to commenting on each Mishnah, uh, or, you know, on the um, Mishnah in, in, in depth, kind of on the page, let's say. Rambam's commentary to the Mishnah also includes a long introduction, kind of an intro to Torah Shaval Peh, and also two extended, let's just call them topical treatises, right? And one of those is called Shmone Prakim, Eight Chapters, um, which is Rambam's intro to Pirkei Avot. And Pirkei Avot deals with ethics, right? It teaches us about uh, righteous a righteous life, a righteous course of action. So it's in Shmona Prakim, Rambam's intro to, uh, to, to Pirkei Avot, that Rambam lays out his view of what constitutes a proper ethical life. Okay, so that's kind of one thing that we're going to look at. That's one set of sources. That's one source. The second source that we'll look at, will, where Rambam also dives into the same set of topics with a lot of overlap, 
will be in the Mishnah Torah, which I quoted a little bit, but we'll go a little bit further. Rambam wrote the Mishnah Torah after the commentary to the Mishnah, okay? And the Mishnah Torah is, of course, uh, it's a codification of Jewish law, but it's not just a legal rule book, right? It's far more than that. And sprinkled throughout, and especially in the early books, are a deep philosophical and let's just say hashkafic insights, um, not just laws, but also the foundations of the Torah, the basics of human character, etc. Okay, so in the section of the first book called Hilchot Deod, which I mentioned, right, the laws of human character traits, Rambam revisits many of the same topics as in Shmona Prakim, and you kind of have to compare those two sources against each other. Okay, so let's start to get this you know, kind of more in-depth view of Rambam's take on this, let's start with Shimon Epreke from, from the commentary on the Mishnah. So Rambam begins the fourth chapter, right? The, the It's called eight chapters, right? The fourth chapter starts with Rambam explaining that the goal of a virtuous life is to follow the middle path, a life of inner balance, an inner, inner balance between ugly extremes. Hey, okay, Rambam writes as follows. He says, virtues are conditions and dispositions which are midway between two reprehensible extremes, one of which is characterized by excess and the other by deficiency. So for example, he gives a bunch of examples. Virtue, the virtue of courage is the middle ground between recklessness and cowardice, okay? In between, that's where you wanna be. Another example, contentedness is the middle ground between greed on the one hand and kind of laziness and indifference on the other hand. You wanna be in the middle. Note that Rambam's presentation on this point is extremely similar to that of Aristotle, who makes the same argument in his great work on ethics called the Nicomachean Ethics. Okay, Aristotle similarly explains that all virtues lie at a mean between extremes of deficiency on one hand and excess on the other. And the fact that Rambam and Aristotle are, al are aligned on this point should not surprise us. Rambam tells us up front in the first chapter uh, that his presentation will draw upon sources from, he says, the Midrashim, the Talmud, other rabbinic works, as well as from, quote, the words of the philosophers, ancient and recent, and also from the works of various authors, he says, as one should accept the truth from wherever source it proceeds. So he tells you that this is, you know, some of this is going to be, you know, consistent, let's say, with the view of the philosophers. The, the proper goal, says Rambam, taught to us by Jewish tradition, and as recognized by the philosophers as well, is to find the golden mean, the middle path, balance between extremes. That's the key to a virtuous life. Okay, so we shouldn't be surprised. The Rambam is gonna be more skeptical about forms of extremism, piety, an extreme piety, asceticism. He's gonna be more skeptical, skeptical uh, about the Nazir, okay? So, but not so fast, okay? Because keep in mind that even if the end goal is to find balance, even if that's kind of who we're supposed to look up to most and, and hope to be, the person that finds amazing balance between extremes, the path to achieving balance may require some more extreme behavior along the way, okay? So that sounds a little weird. Why would, how is it that extremism would be a path to balance? How does that make any sense? Okay, so Rambam gives examples. He says that some people are miserly and selfish for whatever set of historical reasons. That's the way they are today. They take care of themselves, right, primarily. Um, there are other people who are the opposite way. They're kind of, let's just say, wasteful, spendthrifts, people who give or waste away all their money irresponsibly. So those are the two opposite extremes, too tight with your things, too loose with your things. In both cases, the person with extreme tendencies, says Rambam, has a sickness of the soul. They need help. They need to find balance. So how, Rambam asks, do you cure someone with a sickness of the soul? How do you cure someone with a, with a poor character traits? Let's say a selfish person. How do you make a selfish person less selfish? How do you make a wasteful person more responsible? The medicine to get you back, um, the, the medicine for an extreme person to bring you back towards balance, says Rambam, is sometimes to be imbalanced in the opposite extreme, okay? To fight against your own tendencies, let's say, to guide you back to balance. So how does a selfish person become kinder? By giving by giving a lot, by overgiving until it becomes their nature. So by overdoing it temporarily until a change in attitude seeps in, okay? Because the act of giving will actually change you. So if balance is the goal, then imbalance is sometimes the path towards that goal. But Rambam cautions us to be careful 
with this temporary extremism thing because there's a danger. Rambam writes that sometimes it happens that we see someone going to extremes for these spiritually medicinal purposes and we and we mistake it. We don't understand what's going on. So he says that sometimes you might see someone fasting. This is a quote from it. Fasting, keeping nightly vigils, refraining from eating meat and drinking wine, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Rambam says that some pious people engage in these practices with pure intentions, right, as a counterweight to their own inner negative tendencies. But beware, says Rambam, not to confuse temporary medicinal extremism with a permanent state of extremism. And, right? So Ramam writes, and this is another quote, he says, when the ignorant, when the ignorant observe saintly men acting thus, not knowing their motives, they consider their deeds of themselves virtuous. And so blindly imitating their acts, thinking thereby to become like them, chastise their bodies with all kinds of afflictions, imagining that they had acquired perfection and moral worth, and that by this, these means, man would approach nearer to God. And he says, it never dawned on them, however, that these actions were bad and resulted in moral imperfection of the soul, end quote. So basically, Rambam says that some people see others acting in a temporarily, medicinally, let's say, extreme kind of counterweight to their own, uh, to their own tendencies, okay? People see them, and they mistakenly think, hey, if the medicine's good for healing the sick, then why don't we take medicine all the time? Little do they know that medicine is harmful for a person who is healthy, okay? The goal is to be well, not to be medicated all the time. And it's in this context, finally, that Rambam brings up the Nazir, after all that, okay? That he says, basically, that this is the Torah's example of, uh, of extremism. And the Rambam says, here, another quote, he says, the Torah aims at man's following the path of moderation and according with the dictates of nature, eating, drinking, enjoying legitimate sexual intercourse, all in moderation and living among people in honesty and righteousness, but not dwelling in the wilderness or in the mountains or clothing oneself in garments of hair or wool or afflicting the body, okay, continuing on. And then he says, and that is why it tells us about the Nazir, it says that he has to bring the Chatat at the end, okay? So again, the Nazir comes up in that context. So don't be an extremist in general. And here's the Torah giving you a very uh, obvious example of how it views that battle. Okay, so that is that's let's that's Shmonet Prakim, kind of the cliff notes on uh, Rambam's take on extremism in general. Moderation is the goal, and the Nazir as, uh, as a bit of a warning, let's say um, that uh, you know don't don't go this far. Okay, Shmonet Prakim. Okay, now let's turn to Rambam's discussion of the same set of topics in the Mishnah Torah, and in general they are pretty similar. Okay. The Ramam starts out Hilchot in the first chapter. He says, "Hadera Hayashara, he mida habenonit." The straight path is the middle path. Okay, and he goes on in the same vein: don't be wrathful, don't be easily angered. Okay, so don't be. You, you want to find this middle course. You don't want to be uh, easily angered, but you don't want to be. He says, "Dead and without feeling." On the other end, you want to find. He says, "The intermediate path." Okay which he says, for example, there's a quote, he says, you should display anger only when the matter is serious enough to warrant it, okay? Okay, again, same idea, that uh, you should find the middle path in general. He says the path, uh, he says this path is the path of the wise. Every man whose traits are intermediate and equally balanced can be called a wise man, a chacha. Okay, so that's, the chacham, the wise, the sage, okay, the chacham achieves balance, balance in his character. And this is difficult, as we all know. But that's what Rambam says, Jewish tradition and the philosophers advise, be a chacham, be balanced. Okay, so far, so good. So far, it sounds very much like Shmona Prakim. But then the Rambam says something interesting in the next halacha. This is in the fifth, fifth halacha of the, per, of the first chapter. He says, here's a quote, he says, a person who carefully examines his behavior and therefore deviates slightly from the mean to either side is called pious, a chassid. What is implied? One who shuns pride and turns to the other extreme and carries himself lowly is called pious, a chassid. This is the quality of piety, of chassidut. Okay? However, if he separates himself only to the extent that he reaches the mean and displays humility, okay, so if he's if he's, if he's only being extreme as a path back 
to the mean, that's called a chacham. Okay, this is the quality of wisdom. And he says the same, okay, so that's the chacham. And then he says, the chasidim harishonim, the pious of the first generations, would bend their temperaments from the intermediate path towards either of the two extremes. For some traits, they would veer towards the final extreme, for others towards the first extreme. So basically he's saying sometimes they'd be super extreme, sometimes less so. And then he says, this is referred to as lifnim meshurat hadin. Okay, so that, what, what is that about? In the Mishnah Torah, Ramam does something that he did not do in, in Shmon Eprakim, which is that he introduces a new potential model, the saint, the chasid. So in Shmon Eprakim, we saw there was only one legitimate, let's say role model, okay? Balance, the middle path, the chacham, what the Rambam calls in Mishnah Torah, the chacham, okay? The balanced middle of the road, you know, person. Not a person who has no, again, balance does not mean that you have, that you don't have fire in your belly, let's say, right? But you have it for the proper things. You're not, you know, you're not extremely wrathful. You're not extremely passive. You are appropriately passionate, let's say, right? And that's what it means to be in the middle, not to be like, you know, flopping around and, and, and kind of lacking, um, but to be appropriately balanced, let's say, okay? So the Mishnah Torah, we saw similarly, says Chacham, okay, amazing, amazing, but also introduces this second potential role model, the Hasid, the saint, who goes beyond the letter of law, of the law permanently. And what's surprising, not as a path back, not, that's the Chacham, but permanently extreme. And what's surprising is that in the Mishnah Torah, this sounds like an alternative model, not sinful, not a form of spiritual illness, maybe even praiseworthy, okay? So that tension in the Ramam's writing is a mystery that, let's just say scholars, you know, different people looking to interpret the Rambam have long wondered about and tried to resolve. Um, and again, sorry to repeat it, but just so we're all on the same page, the mystery is how is it that in Shimon Eprakim, in the commentary on the Mishnah, Rabbam talks about only one goal, the middle path. Whereas in the Mishnah Torah, his later work, kind of his greatest work, there seem to be two potential role models, two models of a virtuous life, the Chacham and the Hasid, the sage and the saint, the balanced person and the person who is imbalanced permanently, but in a good way somehow. Okay, so without a doubt, the Rambam gets, uh, sorry, the, the Rambam gives the Chacham more airtime even in the Mishnah Torah. Okay, that path, let's say, is the focus, but the Hasid gets honorable mention at least as well. And once you see that, you start to notice that as you go through the Mishnah Torah more broadly, you start to notice that there are actually a bunch of places in the Mishnah Torah that seem to seem more favorable on asceticism than you would have thought. So for example, let's go through some other examples. In the laws of, in Hilchot Talmud Torah, in the third chapter, in the laws of the study of Torah, Ramam says, this is the path of Torah, eat bread with salt, drink water in small measure, sleep on the ground, live a life of difficulty and toil in Torah. And then later in the same chapter, he says, quote, the words of Torah will not be permanently acquired by a person who applies himself feebly to attain them and not by those who study amid pleasure and abundance of food and drink. Rather, one must give up his life for them, for, 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 stor for Torah, okay? He must give up his life for them, constantly straining his body to the point of discomfort without granting sleep to his eyes or slumber to his eyelids, okay? And then elsewhere, for example, in the laws of, um, of prohib prohibited sexual relations, okay? Rambam says, this is in the 21st chapter, he says, quote, anyone who minimizes his sexual conduct is praiseworthy. Sounds rather ascetic, right? We're starting to get a little bit of a different, a different feel. Um, and then in the Mishnah Torah, also we, we talked about in Hilchot uh, Nazirut and the laws of the Nazir. Um, I'll just read you kind of, I mentioned it before, but I'll, I'll read it again. Actually, the broader um, uh, text there. He says, Ramam says, quote, when a person says, I will be a Nazir if I do this, or if I don't do this, okay, he is a wicked man, and and a uh, and a, a vow of Nazir of this type is called a Nazirut of wickedness, okay? So basically, if you're kind of like flippant about it, let's say, or you say, oh, well, you know, if, this, if such and such happens, I'll be a Nazir, 
Okay, if you're not taking it seriously, then uh, that's terrible. If, however, a person takes on a vow of nizirut to God in a holy manner, and this is what I read before, this is delightful and praiseworthy, and okay, et cetera, et cetera, right? That line where uh, where Rambam is much more favorable towards at least some examples of someone who takes a vow of nizirut. So how do we recon reconcile these two sides of the Rambam? One that seems entirely focused on the middle path, on the way of the chacham, on the life of balance, right? Who praises all of that as the only model of what we should be shooting for, but on the other hand, seems to open the door for at least some people to take on a more imbalanced path as a way of life, the path of the Hasid, the path of the saint, okay? Um, okay, or another way of asking this, why does Rambam present, at least in Hilchot Deod, in the Mishnah Torah, two models of a virtuous life, the Chacham and the Hasid, and First of all, why introduce two models? And then you have to ask, which one is greater? Is one greater than the other? And if so, which? And why not say so? Okay. So the last section of what we're going to learn tonight is three different possibilities of how to resolve this tension in the Rambam. How to resolve this oddity that... Um, that there seem to be two potential models. And it's not, in it's not entirely clear as you read through without doing some work, what the relationship is between them, between the Chacham and the Hasid, again, the extremist versus the balanced. And let's just, since we're, this will be the last section, but let's just remind ourselves why we're talking about this tonight, okay? Because we've gotten so deep in the weeds, so apologies for that, but let's just take a step back and remind ourselves, why are we even talking about this? Because why are we trying to figure out what the Rambam's view on this esoteric, somewhat esoteric topic is? Because it's Elul. <laughs> because we're trying to figure out how to improve ourselves. We're trying to figure out what kind of people we want to be in this upcoming year. So we would like to know, at least according to the Rambam's opinion, um, one of the all-time greats in our tradition, what does he have to say? What, what are, when we get to Rosh Hashanah, when we get to Yom Kippur, and we think about how we want to be better next year, what does better look like? Okay, so that's that's why we're we're digging so deeply into this. Okay, so three possibilities, three interpretations of what of what is the relationship in Rambam's thought between balance and imbalance. Let's say the chacham and the chasid, the sage and the saint. Okay, possibility one. So, uh, and I'm just going to go through possibilities. We're actually not going to resolve it. That will be for people that's above my pay grade. I'll leave that to to greater scholars than me. But let's at least lay out three possible readings. Okay, the first is, the first reading is the simplest, which is to say that we should take the Rambam's presentation, Shimon and Prakim, at face value, as the true core of Rambam's opinion, and which is largely consistent with what we find in the Mishnah Torah as well, which is to say that Rambam's fundamental view is in line with the philosophers, in line with Aristotle, that the model, at least generally speaking, right, that the model of moral perfection is the balanced person who strives, however difficult that is, to find the middle path between extremes, the chacham, the path of balance and moderation, okay? By the way, let's just say, moderation is actually pretty hard to achieve, and it's pretty hard to attain. So this is not, you know, through all of life's up, ups and downs, this is actually hard. Staying balanced is an active thing, not a passive thing. Um, and in this reading, that is the goal for everyone, at least in theory, to achieve balance. So then you say, why open up the model of the Hasid? Why talk about the saint? Okay, why all this positive talk about what seem to be more extreme levels of piety and self-restraint that we saw before, bordering on asceticism? Why all that positive talk about that? So in this reading, the answer would be that in practice, right, in theory, the middle path is the answer, or the end goal, let's say, the ideal. But in practice, we're all different. We grow up in different environments. We have we each have different, let's say, deeply ingrained tendencies, different one from the other. We each start from a different place in our, in our ethical journey, okay? And the implication is that we are all on different spiritual paths, different spiritual journeys, even if headed to the same place. So much of what we do is to perfect ourselves involves recalibrating ourselves and involves looking at our strengths and weaknesses honestly and doing our best 
to counteract our worst tendencies and let's say accentuate, accentuate our best ones, okay? And so we need to be self-aware because many of our most extreme personality traits are at their core about selfishness, about self-centeredness, and that's natural. That's how people are, right? So it's not uncommon that since selfishness and self-centeredness is so natural for people, it's only natural that most people's spiritual journeys will involve a healthy dose of self-restraint because that is the counterbalance to self-centeredness. And so since self-centeredness is so common, the need for extra self-restraint is also so common, okay? To force us to be less self-obsessed. And I should say at this point, think about how different this is than the moral language that's more common in pop culture today, let's say. Okay, today we talk more about looking inside to find your true self. Okay, we talk about finding and channeling kind of the true inner you that's hiding inside. If only you could wipe away all of the artificial constraints that society or your family or your class or whatever it is that's imposing it upon you. Okay, that's kind of a more, I would say, contemporary way of talking about self actualization. Rama's view is very different than that. Rama's view is that. Um, it's not just about finding kind of the true you inside of you. Rama's view seems to be that you are a work in progress and that you're endowed with amazing potential. And the goal is to mold yourself into the best version of yourself that you can be. And to do that, you do have to be self-aware. So you, there is an introspection, right? You have to recognize what are your true strengths and your true weaknesses and your tendencies, some of which... Um, maybe require some medicine, right, to treat. The goal isn't just to like kind of find the real you inside, it's to work towards becoming a better you, which the Ramam says you can do. Um, and the path to getting there involves the hard work of going sometimes against what feels natural to you at the moment. Okay, that's definitely a big part of this story. Um, that sometimes it's important for you to actually go against what feels natural to you and perhaps going against what society tells you is right, okay? So Ramam, um, in this reading, doesn't embrace asceticism as an ideal, but the reality is that in general, people need a focus on combating their natural self-centeredness. And so most people will in practice have to, have to be extreme in their self-restraint, self-restraint. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. So in this reading, Shmone Prakim um, is the, the kind of, in this reading, the explanation of why in um, Mishnah Torah you, you have to learn about the, the Chacham and the Hasid is that Shmone Prakim is a more theoretical work. It's focused on the ideal of finding balance. Mishnah Torah, on the other hand, is a more practical work. And practically speaking, most of us will need, even if we all want to be a Chacham, to have a little bit of the Hasid inside of us. And so therefore um, they're both presented as all, not as alternatives, but at both as important, let's say, uh, you know, models for us. Okay, so that was reading one, reading one. The goal in reading one is to be a Chacham, but on the way, most of us will have to be a Hasid at least a bit. Okay, reading two. The second approach takes the Hasid the extremist, more seriously, actually as an ideal, not just as a means to an end, as really a, a role model, okay? In fact, the second approach is says that for Rambam, the Hasid may even be a higher level than the Chacham, okay? That a certain amount of imbalance may actually be a way of achieving a higher level than the middle path can ever get you to, okay? But here's the key, is not for everyone. <laughs> only for some people. So in this view, the balanced life, the life of the Chacham, is the predominant model for most people. In this view, um, most of the time, people should be, should be putting their efforts into finding balance. That's good advice for most people, and it's hard enough to achieve for most people. But for some, for outliers, who strive for a higher level of excellence, who strive for an extreme level of excellence, let's say, a little bit of extremism is required to get there. Some people are meant to pursue the path of the Hasid, to go beyond the letter of the law forever, okay? So balance is 
difficult and commendable and more than most people can probably pull off. But to be exceptional, you sometimes need to be a little bit out there beyond. That just goes with the territory if you're pushing for this highest level of achievement. And the question is, then, how do you know which one you are? Are you the kind of person who would be better off striving for balance, who should fight your imbalanced tendencies and view them as uh, spiritual afflictions, let's call them, right? As, as things that need to be pushed back on as hard as possible? Or are you the kind of person for whom a little bit of imbalance is just part of what drives you to a higher level of excellence? Are you one of the rare few that we might forgive and maybe even praise for being a little off center as you strive for big things? So the truth is, that's actually a hard question to answer and requires you to be honest with yourself. Um, and the Rambam cautions us that you can't always trust your gut on this because it's so easy to rationalize, to explain to yourself that what you're doing is the right thing, even if you're actually just indulging your own, whatever it is, imbalance, self-centeredness, laziness, other imbalances. Most of the time for most people, imbalance is a self-indulgence, okay? And this is also an interesting point that Rambam makes. Even extreme piety, which you would say with a Ramban kind of approach, like how can you be too extreme in your piety? But at least according to Ramban's view, even extreme piety can be an indulgence. You have to ask yourself, is this actually making me better or is it a spiritual addiction? Is going to extremes for me actually the easier path, something that I need to moderate? Okay, so that's an interesting, interesting point. To sum it up, to sum it up. Um, in this second view, the middle path is the most praiseworthy, most praiseworthy, and the goal for most people. Most people have a hard enough time just working to find some semblance of balance in themselves and in their lives. And the more that they can work towards balance, the better. That the more successful they will be. Okay. But some people are special. Some people sometimes need to veer away from the norm. And that imbalance is part of what makes them great. So most people should be a chacham, a select few should strive to be a chassid. And that's why the Rabbam perhaps talks about two types of nazirin, two, two types of nazir. One who's praiseworthy, he does it in the right way. One who is a sinner, who does it in a bad way. Kind of one who is a spiritual addict, right? For whom um, this extreme spirituality is a self-indulgence, maybe who thinks of it as a miracle cure for himself, but actually, actually, it's something imbalanced and, and is another form of, uh, again, kind of self-indulgence, the best word I can think of. Um, so we all have to look ourselves in the mirror honestly and figure out who, who are we, which is the right path for us, um, which may not be the right path for the next person. Okay, so just to sum that up, the second reading, the first reading of the Rambam, of the Rambam was the Chacham is the goal, balance is the goal. It's just that we all need a little Hasid, you know, Hasid, not in the Hasidist kind of sense, but a little bit of extremism to get there. Um, the second goal, the second reading that um, that different strokes for different folks to some extent, but for most people, balance would be great. For some people, extremism um, is uh, is actually what they need. Okay, here's a third, and then with this we'll end. Okay, the third reading of the Rambam is a su I think a super interesting one um, that was suggested in a piece by Rabbi. Uh, Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, okay? He, Rabbi Sachs starts off by making a very interesting point, which is that so far we've been asking all of these questions about how to live, these theoretical questions, whether it be more balanced or more radical, to be more like a saint, more like a sage. We've been asking all these questions purely from the standpoint of the individual, as if the only question was, how can I spiritually perfect myself? How can I be the best that I can be? And as you say I over and over and over again, what Rabbi Sachs points out that is, aren't we forgetting something? What about everyone else? Okay, you're not alone in this world and what you do impacts others. So the question perhaps should not just be how do I spiritually per perfect myself, but also what kind of character does it take to be a great member of the, of the collective, of the team, of society, of Am Yisrael. And Rabbi Sachs puts it this way. So let's just, he, he will always say it better. So I'm going to read from him. He says, essentially, there are two ways of understanding the moral life itself. 
is the aim of the moral life to achieve personal per perfection? Or is it to create a decent, just, and compassionate society? The intuitive answer of most people would be to say both. That is what makes Rambam so acute a thinker. He realizes that you cannot have both. They are, in fact, different enterprises. And this is Rabbi Sack continuing. He says, a saint may give all his money away to the poor, but what about the members of the saint's own family? Okay, basically, if, he gives, if he's so saintly, he's neglecting his own family. In this, in this respect of giving away all their money. Then Rabbi Sachs continues, a saint may refuse to fight in battle, but what about the saint's own country? A saint may forgive all crimes committed against him, but what about the rule of law and justice? Saints are supremely virtuous people considered as individuals, yet you cannot build a society out of saints alone. Okay, end quote. Well, Rabbi Sachs is pointing out something that I think is actually pretty profound, which is, that even in the quest for that even the quest for spiritual self-perfection can itself be an indulgence. Sometimes focusing exclusively on my own spirituality can be a selfish act. It's not that you have bad intentions. Your intentions are l'shem shemaim, they're for the sake of heaven. Okay, and in that sense, you are doing holy work. You're trying to perfect your, your yourself spiritually. And you're doing all this hard work to get there. But in another sense, you're failing to take into account your role as a member of a group. And in that sense, when you focus only on yourself, only even on your spiritual self, you're missing the big picture. Okay, and again, here's how Rabbi Sachs puts it. He says, he says, ultimately, saints are not really interested in society. Their concern is the salvation of the soul. This deep insight is what led Rambam to his seemingly contradictory evaluations of the Nazarite. The Nazarite has chosen, at least for a period, to adopt a life of extreme self-denial. He is a saint, a Hasid. He has adopted the path of personal perfection. That is noble, commendable, and exemplary. But it is not the way of the sage. And here's the key line. And you need sages if you seek to perfect society. The sage is not an extremist because he or she realizes that there are other people at stake. There, uh, there are the members of one's own family and the others within one's community. There's a country to defend and an economy to sustain. The sage knows he or she cannot leave all these commitments behind to pursue a life of solitary virtue. For we are called on by God to live in the world, not escape from it, to exist in society, not seclusion, to strive to create a balance among the conflicting pressures upon us, not to focus on some while neglecting the others. And in the last line, he says, hence, while from a personal perspective, the, Na the Nazarite is a saint, from a societal perspective, he is at least figuratively a sinner who has to bring an atonement offering. Okay, so that's how Rabbi Sachs puts it. And just to unpack it, I think this is an amazing insight that sometimes, sometimes, there can be a trade off between your personal spiritual quest and your ability to be a team player contributing to those around you, to your family, to your community, to your society, to your nation, because you don't live in a vacuum and your personal spiritual choices can affect everyone else as well. And so we often focus on spirituality as if, again, as if it's only kind of one person at a time about your own spiritual development on your own, your own spiritual goals and needs. Rabbi Sachs points out, just beware that you don't pursue your spiritual goals at the expense of others, because what matters in the big picture is not just your spiritual achievement, but also our collective success. And so Rabbi Sachs says that Rambam understood this, that Rambam's nuanced view of the Chacham and the Hasid and his view of the Nazir, okay, that the, Rambam, the Rambam's nuanced view recognizes that from a private standpoint, it is tempting to be a saint, to push yourself to the extreme. There's something special and uplifting about that kind of pure spiritual life because a more extreme version of spirituality is a more intense version of spirituality. And isn't that a good thing, right? That sounds amazing. That's where the Ramban was coming from, it seems, right? How can more, how can more personal perfection be bad? 
the Ramban might might say. That sounds nuts, right? That how can we not have a, of a, a, a an appreciation for the benefits of a more intense, saintly, spiritual experience? What could possibly be wrong with that? Says the the Ramban, right? That we saw earlier on, the bigger fan of the Nazir. Rabbi Sachs says that, and he's saying the Ram, this is the Ramam's view. Rabbi Sachs says that we must recognize that sometimes there are trade offs between your private spiritual needs and what the community needs from you. And that with that broader frame of the community or the nation, we sometimes have to ask you, you to even sacrifice some of your own spiritual quest to some extent, because we need you to be more balanced for our sake as part of the team, because it's hard, you might say, to build a team full of radicals, okay? A team full of radicals just doesn't work. And whether or not this is exactly what the Rambam is getting at, um, it, isn't, it does seem, at least, I will say it seems like an important insight. The, the Torah gives us a path towards two things, two things that are usually aligned, but not necessarily aligned in every case, right? The Torah gives us a path towards our personal spiritual growth for you as an individual to be the best person that you can be. But the Torah also creates a path for our building together a decent, just, and secure society. And that looks at you and asks you to be a team player. And it asks you to make all of us the best that we can be. And those things often overlap, but they don't necessarily, right? If you think about it, like in a team player context, right? You can imagine a player who puts up huge points, let's say with a basketball, you know, basketball uh, analogy. You can imagine a player who's putting up giant stats, but is not helping the team exactly be the best that they can be. And those things often overlap, right? We usually want everybody to play to their highest capabilities as individuals, but, there, but it, when you think about it in a kind of a team context, you understand perhaps a little bit more how, you know, again, a monk may be deeply pious, in that sense, deeply holy, and yet be letting other people down as he lives up in his monastery and, and, and is so consumed with his own spiritual perfection that he doesn't bring all of his talents and resources to make the team, the nation, the community as good as it can be. Okay, so those were the three readings. I'm just going to recap it because we went for a while and there was so much to cover. So I'll just give a quick recap um, that we can leave with. Okay, so just to recap, because we covered a lot of ground. It's Elul. And you can think of tshuva on two different levels. One on a tactical level, a tactical level versus a strategic level. Both are, which, both are important, okay? On a tactical level, we should all try to do a little better. One mitzvah at a time from the ground up one New Year's resolution at a time. It all starts with doing and changing bit by bit from the bottom up, okay? But there's also tshuva on a strategic level, you could say in a goal-oriented kind of way. That's where you ask the big questions. Who am I trying to be? Who are my role models? And that's a little bit what we focused on tonight, okay? And that led us to a whole discussion of the Nazir and a discussion about the merits of two different models uh, that the Rambam laid out a model of piety, extremeness, asceticism versus a life of balance and moderation. And both of them are, are, are hard to maintain, are hard to achieve. Um, a life of extreme piety is clearly not easy. The ascetic gives up a lot of things. So if we're honest with ourselves, there are people for whom this mode may actually be more comfortable and for whom you know, maybe that plays uh, to the easier path for them, let's say. Okay, maintaining a middle path, a life of balance, is also very hard to maintain. Just look at the world around us. Look how hard it is to maintain any semblance of moderation. It is actually quite hard, okay? Both are challenging goals. The question is, which is more desirable? And for the Ramban, the Ramban that we started with, the question was easier. Go big, halavai, that you should be a Nazir forever. But for the Rambam, whose view we focused on much more, his Rambam's view was much more nuanced, much more complicated, and we saw three different possible readings of the Rambam. The first one, that balance and moderation is the goal for everyone. But while that's theoretically the goal, we recognize that in practice, everyone starts from a different place. And so you shouldn't be surprised if we each have a different spiritual journey ahead of us. That's to be expected. It's actually good because we're not all the same. We don't start from the same place. Even if we're headed towards the same place, we should all be taking different paths, which means that the path to a moral life is not just about discovering kind of self-discovery, okay? It's not just about digging up your inner authentic self, though it is important to be honest with yourself about your strengths and weaknesses, but the goal in this view is to craft yourself, 
out of the potential that you have, um, sometimes fighting against your own nature, um, against your own nurture or nature. Um, it's about molding yourself towards the middle path, which takes hard worth, hard work, often against your own nature. Okay? That was kind of view number one. View number two, which is that the balance that you have to kind of look in it, at yourself with an honest eye. Are you like most people? Like most people in reality, for whom it's hard enough to find balance and balance would do you good? Or are you more like an outlier who needs to push beyond and be and pushing beyond requires a certain amount of imbalance, even on a permanent basis? That's kind of view number two. And finally, finally, we looked at the beautiful insight of Rabbi Sachs that we have to zoom out because it's not all about you and your individual spiritual needs. You also have to take into account the needs of the community. And sometimes there are trade-offs between you chasing your private spiritual goals, there are trade-offs sometimes between that and you're living up to your obligations to your family, community, and nation, which means that sometimes you have to moderate even your own spiritual quest so that you can be a more valuable contributor to the team. Okay. Lots to think about in the month ahead. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Sorry, guys, I ran long. Elo's tough. Thank you. It's tough, Thank to, you tough to keep together this month. This, maybe this is why, like, um, uh, you know, the Shabbat Shuvah drasha, the, the rabbi, like, a, like an actual real rabbi, would give, like, tends to, like, go on, you know, for a very long time. It's, it's hard to package... Hard to package up uh, Elul in uh, in even an hour, but thanks everyone for joining. Let's go off, Josh. Have a good one. All right, thanks. Yeah. Very All well right. presented. Thank you. All right. Good night, everyone. Take care. <laughs>